In the next few lectures, we are going to study about the memory management part of the operating system. So in the introduction, we have seen that the operating system provides an abstraction of virtual memory. That is, whatever the actual memory RAM is there in your system in the hardware, a virtualized view of that, an abstraction of that is made visible to the user processes via the operating system. So in this lecture, we're going to just spend some time understanding what do we mean by virtual memory. So why do you need to virtualize memory? Why do you have to abstract it out? Why can't you expose the real view of the memory? Because the real view of the actual physical memory is very, very messy. So in the earlier days, the RAM of a machine would only have the code and data of one process and probably some code of the operating system. So it was fairly clean and, you know, the process could know what where its code was residing in the actual memory. But today, that is not the case. Today, multiple processes run concurrently on the CPU and they time share the CPU. So because of that, you have the code and data of process A, process B, process C, many different processes residing in memory at the same time at different parts of the memory. And here in this uh, diagram, this is the complete 5, 12 KB memory of the system. You can see that the three different processes are there in different parts. Some part of the memory is free. Then you have the operating system at another part of the memory and so on. But in real life, it's even more messy. You have hundreds of thousands of processes running on a machine. And the code and data of every process may not even be stored in one chunk like this. It can also be non-contiguous, right? So a process's code and data can be spread over different parts of the memory and interspersed with many other processes. As you can see, all of this view is very messy and all of this view, this complexity must be hidden from the programmer, from the user. When you write your code, you should not have to worry about where into how many pieces my code will be broken and placed into memory and so on. Right. So because of that, the operating system virtualizes the memory and provides a clean abstraction to user programs. So what is the abstraction that is provided to user programs? This abstraction is called a address space or a virtual address space. So what is the virtual address space of a process? So every process assumes it has access to a large contiguous space of memory, starting from address zero, byte number zero to some maximum value, right? So every process thinks the actual RAM looks something like this. This is called the address space or virtual address space of a process. So every, the compiler compiles the code of the process and places the code and variables here and various other things are built into the memory image. So what all does the memory image contain? It contains the code along with any variables you declare in your program. Then there is the heap. Whenever you're running your program and you do malloc, right? When you dynamically allocate memory, it comes from the heap. Then there is a part of the address space that's called the stack. Whenever you make function calls, you pass arguments to functions, you have return values from functions, all of that are placed on the stack. So in this way, a program, a user program views the memory as containing code, heap and stack arranged in one large contiguous address space like this, starting from memory address 0 to memory address some maximum value. And when this program is running, the CPU issues load and store instructions. The CPU says, fetch me a program at uh, the instruction at byte 0, instruction at byte 1, instruction at byte 2, right? The CPU fetches these instructions, reads and writes data in the heap or in the stack, wherever. And all of these accesses happen to virtual addresses. The CPU simply says, give me address 0 and the instruction at address 0 or the data at address 0 appears at the CPU, right? So this is all that the CPU and the user program and all of this know. So in your program, if you print out the address of a variable, right, you print out the value stored in a pointer variable, all you're going to see are these virtual addresses, you know, a variable here or here or here and so on. But in real life, this is not how a program is stored. Every program is not stored from byte number zero to some maximum value, right? So what happens when you access a certain address? 
somebody translates from virtual addresses to physical addresses right the cpu issues a load store instruction it says get me something from this address get me something from this address but a translation happens from those addresses to the actual physical location in memory to the actual physical addresses right for example here is your uh, virtual address space of a process here is a program that is running has some code heap stack and so on this is the virtual address space of a process and when you issue a load or store instruction to some piece of code over here that piece of code will get accessed from its actual location in memory right so who's doing this translation so note that the operating system knows where a process is residing right because the operating system allocates memory and it keeps track of where i'm keeping the code and data and heap and stack of a process right and the operating system makes this information available to a special piece of hardware called the memory management unit and it is this memory management unit that actually does the translation from virtual addresses to physical addresses so when your cpu tries to access memory it says get me the instruction at virtual address 100 then what happens there is a piece of hardware that is sitting in between which is called the mmu that takes this request of say give me you know something at virtual address 100 it takes this request it translates it into some physical address say 1001 or some other physical address like that it does the translation and sends that request to the memory hardware so that the memory hardware can fetch the code and data from the actual addresses in memory and return it back to the cpu is that clear so this is how address translation happens the user thinks he's accessing an address at a certain virtual address code and data at a certain virtual address whereas the actual memory is seeing is accessing code and data from a different physical address so let's uh, see a simple example of what is called paging so paging is a technique that is used in all modern operating systems right so far we've seen that in this previous picture all the code and data of a process was stored as one chunk right but in real life this is not what happens what happens is something called paging that is the operating system does not place the entire address space of a process all the memory of a process in one chunk instead it splits it into some fixed size chunks called pages similarly physical memory the actual ram is also divided into the same fixed size chunks called physical frames and what does the operating system do whenever a process requests for some memory it will map it will allocate memory in chunks of pages that it will take this page zero of a process say it has the code and data and a part of the heap or something and maps it to a free physical frame say page frame three right and several other mappings for example page one of the process is stored here in physical frame seven and so on right similarly page two page three are stored at different places so whenever a process says give me some memory say during the creation of a process you want to allocate memory you find a free frame like one of these unused free frames you find them and allocate it to store a page of the process and the operating system remembers these mappings there's something called a page table that stores these mappings for this process i place the page zero in so and so physical frame of the memory so these mappings are stored and these mappings are given to the mmu so that the mmu can use these mappings the mmu knows oh you've accessed some code or data in this page but this page is actually stored at this location in hardware the mmu knows this mapping from the virtual page numbers to the physical frame numbers and using that it will translate from virtual addresses to physical addresses right so this is what is called memory virtualization by the operating system a process simply assigns virtual addresses to its code and data and accesses them 
but the actual hardware translates from these virtual addresses to physical addresses. So this whole process of memory virtualization, we have certain goals that the operating system tries to meet. The first is, of course, transparency. The user program should not be aware of all of these messy details. The user program should not know where its actual code and data is placed in physical memory. All it should do is issue load and store instructions to virtual addresses and automatically the code and data should be fetched from physical addresses. So the first goal is transparency. The other, the next goal is efficiency. You don't want to waste a lot of physical memory and you don't want to spend a lot of time because of this virtualization, right? You want to pack the user's code and data into physical RAM as efficiently as possible and you don't want this translation process to take up too much time or too much overhead, right? You want to be as efficient as possible in this whole virtualization. And the last and a very important goal is some form of isolation. That is. A process should only be able to access the code and data in its address space, but not in the address space of some other process, right? We need some notion of isolation and protection. So at this point, I'd like to take a step back and look at all of this from the point of view of a programmer. You are a user, you're writing a program, you're creating a memory image, you're creating a process. So what are all the ways in which you can allocate memory for your code and data? Right? So the OS allocates a set of pages to the memory image of a process, right? The operating system gives you an entire set of pages for the memory image. Within these pages, how can you as a programmer allocate memory to your code and your data? When is this memory allocation happening from the point of view of the user? So this is happening at several places, right? Anytime you write a piece of code, the compiler automatically assigns addresses and assigns memory to the code during compilation process, right? Similarly, any static global variables that you declare are also allocated memory a priori during compile time within the executable itself. When you create your a.out using a C compiler for a C program, there's already memory allocated for the instructions for global variables and so on. And then the next thing that happens is on the stack. Whenever you make a function call, the local variables in that function, the arguments to the function, all of those things are allocated on the stack. And finally, if you want to do malloc, you want to allocate memory at runtime in dynamic data structures, that memory is allocated in the heap, right? So in your program, depending on where you have created a variable, is it a global variable? Is it in a function? Is it a variable that is created by way of malloc? Depending on how you create a certain variable, memory will be allocated in different parts of the memory image of the process, right? So when you malloc, the memory is actually allocated from the heap while your program is running. Whereas if you just declare a static global variable, then that memory is allocated when you compile the program in the executable itself, right? So there is some memory allocated in the executable at compile time, some memory on the stack, some memory on the heap, right? So you as a programmer, you should decide where you want to allocate memory. For example, if you know the size of an array, you will allocate it probably in the executable itself as a static variable. If you do not know the size of an array, you're going to do a malloc during runtime, right? So memory is allocated in different parts of the memory image. So this is the user's point of view. Now, we've seen that anytime you need anything from the operating system like memory, you need to make system calls, right? So what are the system calls that are happening under the hood? Okay, so anytime you allocate memory dynamically, you call malloc. Note that malloc is not a system call. This is actually a function that is implemented by the C library. Okay, and this malloc allocates memory on the heap, right? Anytime you do malloc, some memory is allocated on the heap and a pointer to this is returned to you. And this implementation of malloc in the C library has various algorithms for how do you allocate memory on the heap, how do you manage the free space and so on. We are going to come to this later. And what if the heap runs out, right? The C library has 
allocated a lot of memory and the heap is out of memory. At this point, the C library uses a system call. So this system call is called the BRK or SBRK. There are two variants of it. The difference doesn't matter. So there is a BRK system call that the C library uses in order to grow the heap, right? So once you do a BRK system call, the heap will grow a little bit and you can allocate more memory on the heap once the heap grows, right? So this is one system call that is used to grow the heap. But unlike the other system calls like fork, exec, wait, you are discouraged from using the system call directly in your program, right? Leave it to the C library. You just use malloc. The C library will take care of growing the heap and shrinking the heap as needed. And if you want another chunk of memory, another page of memory in your address space, in the memory image of the process that is not on the heap or the stack or anything, you can do that also, right? There is a separate system call called the MMAP system call, which simply gives you a page in the memory image of your process. That is, it will allocate a chunk of memory and it will give tell you the address of this location. So you can store whatever you want in this page, right? You can store any data structure, whatever you want in this page that the operating system has given to you, right? So this page is referred to as an anonymous page. What is anonymous about it? Don't worry about it. We'll come to it later. But the MMAP system call can be used to return an anonymous page that is an empty page from the operating system to a user program and you can put whatever data you want in that part of the memory. So this is again for advanced programmers if you don't want to do malloc or something like that but you want to manage your own memory then you can just get a page from the operating system put whatever you want on it. Right? So these are the two main system calls to get memory from the operating system. The BRK system call and the MMAP system call. The BRK system call grows the heap. The MMAP system call allocates a page of memory anywhere in the free parts of the address space of a process. So here is a somewhat subtle point. What is the address space of the operating system, right? So here is a process that is running. It has an address space. It has a set of virtual addresses which map to some physical addresses. Now, what if this process makes a system call and it wants to run operating system code, right? So where is the operating system code run? Is it part of the address space of the same process or is it a different address space? What happens? So note that in almost all modern operating systems, the operating system, the kernel is not a separate process with its own address space. Instead, the OS code is part of the address space of every process. What does this mean? The process sees the operating system as part of its code only. For example, like a library, right? So it looks like when you create your executable, when you're running a process, there is some code that you have written and there is some code of the operating system to handle system calls, to handle interrupts, all of that looks like it is part of your executable, your own address space. So that any time you want to make a system call, you simply jump to the operating system code, run this code, and then you can go back again. Okay. And in the background, the operating system ensures that every process thinks the OS code is part of its image. But in reality, there's only one copy of the operating system code in memory and the page tables or some such mechanism basically map this addresses of the operating system to the actual physical addresses of the operating system code residing in the RAM. So this is somewhat of a subtle part. Uh, it's okay if you don't understand it in the first go. So how does the operating system allocate memory for its own data structure? So the operating system has a list of processes. It has various other data structures, right? We've seen it has maintains a list of PCBs, process control blocks. How does the operating system allocate memory for itself? So for large allocations, the OS allocates gives itself a free page. But for smaller allocations, the operating system uses various memory allocation algorithms that we're going to study later. 
Note that the operating system cannot use the C library and malloc in the kernel, right? That's not available to the operating system. So the C library is only a library that is available to C programs, to user programs. Within the kernel, you have to implement your own functionality to allocate memory, right? We are going to study some of these algorithms a little later.